Uh, yeah, I, I've known uh, Greg since I think uh, mid mid '80s, sometime when we both. Um, well, I, I remember getting letters from him that were sort of little poems um, ripped up and pasted on on the envelope and inside the envelope, loose letters, and so it was sort of um, strange uh, letters from him. And we, so we were in touch a little bit um, in the mid '80s, just through the mail and. <clears throat> a little bit later, in 1987, we were both invited to the Torino Film Festival in Italy, um, Torino uh, Gay Film Festival. And um, we both had films there, early films. Mine was Malanoche, and I've forgotten, I've forgotten which one uh, he had that year, but um, we, had, we were also very new to the, um, to the festival circuit, and I just remember... Greg sitting um, in front of a cup of coffee in a palazzo somewhere, um, wearing a Smith's t-shirt, um, smoking Doral's, and um, listening to the Smiths on a, a cassette player, and not wanting to do anything else. He just wanted to listen to the Smiths, and we would be, you know, saying, uh, "We're going to go to this really cool church," and, and he'd say, "I'm just going to stay here and uh, listen to the Smiths." And that was my memory. He's um, changed changed a little bit since then. So um, let me introduce Greg Rocky. Do we, we just sit down, right? Yes, please, yes. Also, um, yeah, we're going to have uh, Mike Dietrich and Craig Gilmore, the stars of the Living End, are here tonight to share the wonderful saga <laughs> the, of the making of this movie. And um, Marcus, who's also going to join us, um, the, who is a producer and got yelled at a lot. <laughs> Mike and I can sit here and hold hands. <laughs> so welcome, guys. Um, awesome work. It was really awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for having us. And thank, special thanks to Gus for doing this. I mean, he's Gus oh, Van He's a thank fucking you. genius and a giant. And the fact that he's here, fucking kind of amazing. It blew me away because we were out there and you introduced me and oh this is Gus and I'm like oh man, nice to meet you Gus <laughs> it's the and Gus. then I didn't when I walk yeah I walked away and I'm like oh okay it's that Gus <laughs> fantastic um, and so there's a character mm -hmm. we named that character in the Living Young is named after Gus <laughs> the guy who slams the door on uh, Luke's face is Gus and uh, I thought there was a, a drugstore cowboy homage too in the movie yeah I saw. Uh, the guy that was <laughs> yeah. shot yeah, the fact was wearing a we, we were talking about that um, earlier in... It said Avenue Pictures. I didn't see Drugstore Cowboy. Uh, I think, yeah, it was in the, um, one, of, one, of the, um, one of the bashers. And it's like, the reason that's in the movie is, like, this movie, it's so shocking to me that 30 years later, we're still screening this movie and talking about this movie. This was literally just... I was just this artsy kid who was really in the Smiths. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, film school, I went to USC film school, and um, it was just like the weird Godard kind of influenced, like artsy, new wave punk filmmaker. And this was just like some little art project that we made, you know, me and my friends. And, you know, Marcus's mom paid for the lab bill. And, you know, and it was... And the chop suey. Yeah, no, we used to, like I said, we used to eat like... Chop suey all the time. Although I was saying, Mike used to eat cans of tuna. Do you remember that? Like literally, he would just eat cans of tuna. That's why he looked like that. <laughs> but it was just this little, like, weird project. And in those days, 
Sundance had not really taken off to the degree that it was, and the indie film world was not what it was. It was sort of start, you know, Sex, Light, and Videotape was obviously before this, but um, it was sort of starting to percolate, but there was never that sense of, like, well, the way Sundance is now, where it's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, direct Black Panther, like, next year. So there was never that, it was really just this, you know, we were just, these weird artsy people and that's why I think it's so fantastic that Gus is doing this because just seeing Gus and um, you know going over these stories again Gus and I our origin stories are so intertwined because um, I was telling Gus earlier like, he was there like I remember I remember you know, we were hanging out when he was making Drugstore Cowboy and my pri my own private Idaho and Gus was there you know throughout like almost all my movies. I remember um, when Mysterious Skin played Toronto, Gus was there. Yeah, I mean, it was just, we've always had this sort of, we've always been on this circuit of festivals and sort of, you know, these kind of screenings and stuff together for 30 years, you know. So it's, it's amazing that you're doing this. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um. Speaking of uh, Sundance being kind of a lot more low key, that certainly was true from the first time I went to the 20 year screening when they uh, took it into the Legacy Project with Edward and the second. But uh, we had a party, if you remember, at the condo. And then Faye Dunaway was there. Brad Pitt was <laughs> there. Was, I totally Jeffrey don't remember. Jeffrey Goldblum was there. Johnny I, Depp was there. <laughs> Winona Ryder was there. So it's not like it was this little small podunk uh, experience. Yeah, I totally don't time. remember. Like Marcus was talking about Brad Pitt being there. I don't yeah, totally yeah, I don't remember, remember that. that definitely. <laughs> but yeah. When uh, when you were, were writing the script for this, um, I had a qu we were talking earlier. I had a question of like how, um, you know, with the origins of the story and your queerness and your um, motivations, um, and you sort of said something great about independent it, cinema. Yeah, I mean, this was really, this is, Living In is my third film, my third feature. I did the two films, I did two black and white $5,000 features that are, super, they weren't, like, the one of them played, like, the new art for, like, three nights and it was such a like huge thing to me but they played a lot of like mainly film festivals and stuff um my first film uh was rejected by every it was called three bullet people in the night it's a 16 millimeter black and white movie and it's not it's kind of queer in the sense that one of the lead characters is this gay performance artist and darcy marta is the, st uh, the star of it she's she plays um She's in this movie as your bestie. But, and anybody who's seen, you know, whatever, any of my movies or <laughs> the TV show I created, there's always that relationship of, like, the gay guy and his best girlfriend. <laughs> like Because that's been such an important relationship, like, throughout I've got my life. mine out there. <laughs> but it's funny because Three uh, Bewildered People in the Night, when you had offered me the role, and I hadn't seen any of your films before, and it happened to be on PBS oh, yeah. that same day. Oh, really? And so I watched it. I don't even remember because you can't Google things back then. I don't even know how I knew it was on. But I just sat there like you, transfixed for an hour and a half as almost nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> but, so funny because I, it was like, yeah, it was on PBS at like midnight or like yeah, 2 a.m. Yeah. or something. And... To this day, people like videotaped it. Like people have VHSs of it and stuff. But yeah, it was like in those days, you know, we were just these sort of struggling artist people, you know, and um, these all these film festivals and all these screenings and stuff became like really our lifeline. And it's where I met Gus. It's where I met Todd Haynes, Rick Linkletter, like Christine Bashone. Like all of us were all doing the same thing, you know, but. All isolated, you know, all like our, in our own little box, doing working on our little passion projects, and that's why these festivals and screenings were like so important to us. But I had done these two other movies that had gay characters in them, but then, but um, I taught a class about independent guerrilla cinema or whatever, and 
Um, Allison Anders actually came and spoke at my class, and, so, and Andrew Sperling, who became one of my producers, she was one of my students. Rocco Bellick, who was in Totally Fucked Up, was one of my students. Um, I taught a class, and you know, my thing, you know, in, in those days also, as Gus has sort of alluded to, I was very kind of punk rock, very kind of angry. And I remember telling uh, me, you had an asymmetric hair. Yeah, I had the haircut like, that was like this, just like it was like Paul Weller, and like the for people that remember Paul Weller from the Style Council, it was just like this wedge of hair. But um, I was telling Mike to, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, so I had this class, and I told. The kids in the class, I'm all, you know, independent cinema is this super exciting, vital movement and thing. And, you know, if you're going to make an independent film, don't make a fucking like Julia Roberts rom com with an indie budget. Like, there's no point to it. You know what I mean? Like, you should really take a risk and like tell a story that's like, you know, whatever, off the deep end, controversial, like different. And that, you know, those words, you know, me telling the kids that really sort of reinforced um, my writing of The Living End. And The Living End was very much a response to the AIDS crisis and, you know, Bush and Reagan. And it's it's kind of where, you know, ACT UP and Queer Nation, all that stuff was born at the same time. And, you know, that's why Sundance 92 was, you know, Swoon and Hours and Times in Paris, like there was this whole movement of just like people, it was in the zeitgeist in a, such a strong way that anybody who was a young queer artist at that time, their work was sort of infused with this kind of passion and anger. So that's very much kind of where living mm -hmm. in. Do you remember that panel at uh, Sundance? The, the, the barbed wire kisses? Yeah, the panel. <laughs> it was the a, famous was an amazing. Yeah, we were talking about I was that. happy to be a fly on the wall that day. <laughs> But we were talking about that. It's we should talk about it because it's in public, so we won't. <laughs> but I actually wasn't on that panel. But we went. Yeah, no, yeah. We went together. You were there. You, oh, yeah, man. you're part of it. Yeah, I was part of it. In spirit. Yes, I was too. Then. Yeah. I was not part of it. <laughs> you were invited but though, and you I just was, you just didn't want to come. I just didn't understand what it was. You're like, what, am I, but, what queer new wave? What's that? Derek Jarman was the um, sort of. Overlord of the yeah, Derek. Yeah, Derek is huge, huge influence. You know, in, in the, like really, um, in terms of because you know, as like I said, we were, I was just this arty kid and just like so enamored of that, that sensibility of just this kind of fearless queerness and you know that, um, that um, was just a big, you know, important influence. Yeah, for me, I think. Um, <clears throat> His Last of England yeah, was um, I love that movie sort of a breakthrough. I mean, I think he had done Caravaggio by, before that, but um, The Last of England was sort of this amazing 8-millimeter, <clears throat> super 8-millimeter. Why aren't um, they showing that here? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. It was very inspiring. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it is, and also, like, your work, very painterly. You know what I mean? Like, the images are just gorgeous, and Tilda Swinton and everything. Anyway. Also, I think um, Greg is a member of the new queer cinema, but also um, the new stoner cinema. <laughs> and maybe the new psychedelic cinema as well. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> because I think, I mean, it's a reoccurring theme in your, in your, in your later films. Um, stoner behavior, I think, <laughs> becomes, becomes a, a fun theme. Yeah, no, there's definitely, uh, yeah. Definitely that aspect. And also another thing that for us, it was, you know, very, like, I'm super influenced by, you know, post-punk music and punk music. And I remember you talking about going to RISD with David Byrne from the Talking Heads. And, you know, just like, that's where we came from. You know, this sort of really cool and amazing open time in culture where things were really changing and happening. And it was just like this wide, you know, horizon of just like all these exciting, fun things to do. And we were just, that, and we were artists, but, you know, film was sort of our chosen thing. So Marcus, um, what's up over there? <laughs> Marcus, wake up! <laughs> um, how was, how was um, producing this, this project? 
Well, I mean, like I was explaining, for me, it was a very different kind of experience as a producer. I mean, Greg was teaching me how to produce a movie, and I was just more or less his assistant. Um, you know, the, the best parts were, you know, Mike Dietrich happened to be a neighbor right by my house, and I go, oh, my God, he's the one. Um, they should be playing it, and brought him, introduced him to Greg, and then Craig, we actually kind of met through um actually we went through a bunch of photos right we did a yeah, lot we, all, we had like shots. an audition process i think yeah. and you like sent it yeah it was a it was something i learned from usc film like student films just like putting in drama log or whatever yeah. and um we had auditions and you know i mean we were so for again it was just it's amazing to me that we're even here i mean we were so fortunate that you guys, you know, nobody got paid. It's just like there was no, it was literally like the fact that you guys showed up every you know, time we were shooting. And it was, the film was shot over the span of like weeks. I think, can't remember how many weeks it was. And Mike was saying that he hurt his eye or something in the middle of, do you remember that? I don't remember that, no. Yeah, we had to take a couple of months off, like a, a month and a half off. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, I. Because you hurt your eye? I tripped and ended up smashing above and below my INA to get stitches. So it was it was more than a few weeks. It yeah, was I a don't, few months. I don't remember any of this, but it's all been blocked from my memory. It is a blur. But it was really crazy because we would, you know, this, the crew was literally, sometimes it was literally just me and Marcus. And John, like I remember when we were shooting a lot of the driving at night footage, we, were, we took a road trip to San Francisco to shoot like the bridge and all that. And we shot sort of along the five and stuff. And it was literally just me and Marcus and John in the car with the Bolex like filming. You but know. don't you also remember we we were so broke that we just ended up sending the film to Rick Linklater, and he actually shot footage for us and oh, sent yeah. it back. No, he no, so that's that we true. Would have additional, Rick uh, Linklater uh, shot the Texas footage, like yeah. there's because there's actually so it wouldn't look like they were just driving around Los Angeles, which is what we were doing. <laughs> but there's actually a shot from Texas that like Rick and I did we send him the camera? I think he just sent it to us. No, we sent him film, Did, but, and then he sent it back to us, uh, and then we had it developed. Yeah, we should. He should get. He should get second unit credit for that. <laughs> but yeah, that's how it was in those days. It was just very sort of makeshift and you know, fly by night. How did it work with the um, screenplay? Was it something that was finished, or or something that evolved as you were filming? It was very finished. It was set, yeah. Yeah, it was, Everything, so it was like, say I mean, those words. It's yeah, got exactly. kind of an organic feel to it, but pretty much all of those words were what came out of his pen. It's uh, My films have always been that way in the sense that because they're so low budget and the, the uh, schedule is so tight, there is a little bit of room for a line here or there or improvise this or that, but the structure of it is always, I work on the script a lot, Till I feel like it's ready. I don't like, because I know like the script for Private Idaho is like 20 pages long or something. And it's literally just like a blueprint of like what's to come. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, just additions. Yeah, in I have, my a, case. I, by the way, I have, a, 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 I have that fucking script in my, in one of my archives. It's just like, on, it's like on this old computer type of that. <laughs> anyway. And then from here, uh, from this film, what was, how did this progress to the next next project? Um, well, it was weird. The Totally Fucked Up and Living End are very much hand in hand. Um, we shot Living End. I think we finished it. Yeah. And then I shot Totally Fucked Up, and you were in Totally Fucked Up as well. Um, and then I went back and started editing Living End and then finished Living End, and then, you know, went on the festival circuit and distributed and all that. And, you know, Living End was weird. It was such a, um, it was, as I said, such a small little art project for us. And it was distributed around the world. I was flown to, like, you know, Australia and, you know, all over to promote it. And, you know, Living End is such a funny movie in the sense that it was so, I mean, I don't know, um, I think today, by today's standards, it's. I remember when I did the remastering, it seemed almost tame to me. Like it was all like, 
what was the hubbub about? <laughs> you know, but people would get into fist fights over the Living Inn. Like I've heard several stories about people in bars, like like punching each other over the Living Inn, and people like either really liked the movie or fucking hated it, and they wanted to kill me. Like I, there's so many, and I was I was telling um, I, I, over dinner I was talking about um. They were talking about how, oh, the angry lesbians. There were actually lesbians picketing at the Castro Theater when it played in San Francisco because of the negative portrayal of lesbians, of the you know serial killer lesbians, who, who are Mary Warnoff and Joanne Lent, who are you know, stars on, on themselves. But yeah, so the, it, it was just a super controversial movie. And I remember when it, we were at Sundance, it was – people were just – like <laughs> shocked like the scene in the shower with the, the when I start to come choke me and by the way Craig has the original it's a button that says when I start to come choke me that <laughs> the that one of the producers, Jim Stark, um, had printed for Sundance as a promotional thing. And in Sundance 92, all these people on Main Street were wearing this button that said, when I start to come choke me, it's like, what the fuck is that? So it was, it was whatever, $500 really well spent by Jim Stark. But, um, but yeah, so it was, a, it was a really shocking and very... Um, well, it's hard to imagine now, too, that when it was released... In San Francisco, it played for, I think, 10 days of sold-out performances, 1,400 seats a, a showing. Uh, the Angelica in New York had uh, lines literally up the block. Yeah, it was crazy. Madonna came to see it. Uh, I didn't hear that. I, yeah, heard, I heard Ed Koch yeah. came to see it. No, Ed Koch came to see Mr. Skin. Madonna came to see it. And uh, uh, for two I had a meeting at Maverick, too, I think. Did you? It wasn't with her, though. It was like with some with Madonna. Yeah, like, I didn't get to see Madonna. Madonna. But for two weeks, and this was pretty amazing. For two weeks, it was the most attended film in America per screen. Yeah, it was a, it was crazy to us because again, this twenty thousand dollar like little weird art project, um, it just really took off because it was it it was really the a film of its time, you know, and that's why I'm so glad. You know that it exists in the archives, and um, because it is such a when I when I haven't seen it for a few years, but last time I saw it, um, it's such an artifact for me. Of it puts me exactly in that place of where I was, 1990. You know, the early 90s, and that that feeling of dread and anxiety, and just it's called PTSD. Yeah, yeah, no, because it, it, it's hard for the you know current the the new kids to understand what it was like to be 25 30 years old and feel like you're in a fucking war zone and you know people are just dropping dead on the fucking street and it was literally a black cloud that just hung over everybody and it's something you thought about on a daily basis i guess it's sort of akin to like climate change now yeah i mean it's like literally it's something that's just hanging over your fucking head or the pandemic yeah or, the, or <laughs> covid yeah can we um, maybe have some questions from the audience? Oh, is there a microphone, microphone coming? Let's see. Um, Question wait. for Mike and Craig. Yeah. Okay, well, here's a, here's a person here. Oh, there's somebody over there. Or, okay. Oh. Gus, is, Gus is king oh, of the okay. questions. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yes. So I was curious about the character. Well, first of all, I mean, this movie's amazing, and I haven't seen it in years. And it, I, re I'm realizing now I've lived the last five years of my life like partially inspired by it without even like realizing it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Uh, anyways, like um, the character of Luke, um, was that inspired by anyone real you knew, or was it like <laughs> a purely erotic fantasy? A really bad boyfriend I had. It's like <laughs> the bad boys yeah. in those days. No, it was. Um, it was, you know, the film is actually weirdly um, very much inspired by uh, Howard Hawks' film Bringing Up Baby, which is a, 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 me being a film school nerd. Um, and it's funny because I met Robin Wood. Like, there was a, Robin Wood, the film critic, wrote an article called The Lure of Irresponsibility. And that's where the title comes from, Irresponsible Movie. And the, bring it, the, the sort of 
symbolic whatever structure of bringing up baby is like this very uptight kind of orderly character played by Cary Grant, his world is turned upside down by this sort of free-spirited, just insane Catherine Hepburn character. And they have this attraction and this, you know, sort of desire for each other, but also he, 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 she ends up kind of destroying him, basically. And so that, that structure was a, very much a part of kind of where um, it came from, and you know the characters named John and Luke, like for Jean Luc Godard, me being the film nerd that I am. So, but that was part of sort of what the um, idea of it was. Uh, I was also curious for um, the actor, sorry, who played Luke. Um, I forget, sorry, your name. Mike Dietrich, yeah. the one and only Mike Dietrich. <laughs> we were just um, talking. We were watching the the last scene in the lobby. It's like, you know, we had no budget, no crew, nothing, and. I was amazed at that last scene on the beach. You guys are doing like the most crazy hair acting I've ever seen. Your hair is so fucking perfect, both of you. And I'm all, we didn't have a hair, we didn't have a hair person. Uh, we didn't, li- nothing. Like we didn't have wardrobe person, nothing. <laughs> like, so it's like their hair is so, like, it's like you just, anyway. It's been a while since I could do hair <laughs> acting. <laughs> you too. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Well, well, question for Mike, right? I was wondering how it changed, affected your life. Like, what, uh, what, what, that, what the story was like for you. It's interesting because I came into this not having really any clue what the fuck was going to happen <laughs> in terms of the movie or how I'd be involved and, you know, kind of how it transpired. I mean, I was, at that time, going on auditions, you know, you know, wanting to make something of an acting career. And then I'm not sure how Marcus connect. I, I'm not really sure if that was correct, what you said in terms of, oh, I saw this, I saw Mike, he's a neighbor. I don't know if it was before Life is Nice or after Life is Nice, but the first thing, Definitely before that. the first thing that I uh, remember is, okay, um, I was stoned most of the most of the <laughs> um, so I, I'm not sure if that, that influenced the whole stoner thing you know that came after Gus that. picked that up yeah. <laughs> I, I did not sense that <laughs> but you know I think me personally I looked I, when I read the script I was like you know this is acting you know I, I mean I don't have to be gay to play a gay character or I don't have to, you know, this, that, or the other. And I, I just tried to, you know, be there uh, and follow direction and add whatever it would, you know, was that I could add in the moment. And um, to this day, I was I was just telling them over dinner a couple of weeks ago, somebody, and I get them, you know, fairly often, but this DM and they, they said, I just saw this MTV interview with you, you know, uh, The Living End and, and, you know, it really changed my life and, you know, it's it's cool. Um, it's Yeah, this was a time too, this is like many, many years before Brokeback Mountain, many, many years before like gay, you know, straight actors were playing gay characters, but never. Yeah, <laughs> Ellen hadn't even come out. Yeah, no, El- <laughs> no Will and Grace, Rosie no O'Donnell. Ellen. Like literally, the the only gay things were um, like films from Europe. I remember but, um, Elma Dover's like Law of Desire, Matador. Were, like the thing big. that I the thing that I got from it though was, and even when I met you, I was like, oh, this guy reminds me of Bruce Lee. You know, he's like really cut and he's really deep, <laughs> and he had these arms, and and I was always a Bruce Lee fan growing up, and he was like kind of my hero, and I was like, oh, this guy's kind of cool and. We had a lot of the same musical, uh, you know, tastes and this whole sort of angle. And I was like, he doesn't seem like he's gay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then you looked at Marcus and like, oh, well, he's gay. Well, I knew he was gay, of course. <laughs> he, he maybe made a few passes at me back then. I'm not really sure. But I didn't really look at the script as... Uh, or the character as it was a gay character or as a gay, I was almost just looking at it as, you know, people. And it might have even, it might have even been, uh, you know, the naive of me at that time. I was a kid, 
And you were you were both really young, right? Like like yeah. twenty two. Like or I was twenty five when we I filmed. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I just always looked at it that way. I never really considered the character. And I think you're almost like the maverick or vanguard of gender fluidity, you know, in a sense, um, as we talk about it now. So, yeah. Cool. Another question? Up there, you guys have another question. Oh, no more question. Oh, oh here, right here. Oh, oh okay, I guess we um, hi, I'm a huge fan of your movies and their soundtracks. Um, they're how I found my love. Are you talking to guys. Gus or me? <laughs> <laughs> you, um, I'm a fan of both. It's of you, like but. I'm a huge fan of your movies, and I don't know who that other guy is up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering um, what your process is like for curating soundtracks. The, the music, you mean? Yes. I mean, I music is such a big, big part of my life. It's more. Um, I don't want to say it's more important to me than movies, but it's right up there. I mean, I'm so lucky in terms of where, when I was born and the timing of my life, you know. It's like um, I was, you know, early high, sc high school, early college, like right when like the punk explosion happened and um, new wave music. And as I was talking about earlier, the whole culture was just kind of, on fire a little bit, you know, I was, you know, I was so into like the talking heads and X and I remember when I was in film school at USC, um, we used to uh, like see X all the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was just like, and that spirit has been such an important part of my filmmaking process. Um, it's very much why, um, you know, I always, my idols, you know, like the Cocteau Twins or whatever, were never like super hugely popular or commercial, but they meant so much to me, and that's always kind of what I aspired for in my movies. So when I, you know, I listen to music literally from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, and it's such a big inspiration to me. And um, this movie in particular, you know, there's so much, like The Living End is actually um, the name of a Jesus and Mary Chain song, and it, that is uh, <laughs> um, that part's important like the sort of industrial music and the angriness like the KMFDM and they have that play that song God like that at the beginning I was just really into all that stuff you know it's like that was my my thing and it, it was really I think in a way like my tribe very much like indie film and Sundance and um, you know, Berlin Film Festival and everything and like where I'm like you know when I saw Gus it's like you that is where we belong you know and it was a very important part of that hi uh USC film student here who actually got rejected from U UCLA wait as I well. don't know where this question is coming from it's <laughs> invisible hi. okay okay um, right, okay wait yeah, your hand. I also got rejected from UCLA I got into USC film school <laughs> and um, oh you went to uh, yeah right UCLA is hard to get into I guess well, I should have. Right? Have, yeah, they're, they're really discerning. Like, <laughs> but I thank God I got into USC. Yeah, I was okay. So that was my first question: Is you were at USC Film School, but you had to break into UCLA to f cut your film? Yeah, I don't. It's like it's all I don't <laughs> was that barely just remember an aesthetic it. Aesthetic choice. It was no. It was very much um, <laughs> in those days. As I said, I because the films were so low budget and I didn't have money for it. I mean, Living In is a little bit different because, Mar as I said, Marcus's mom paid for the Chinese food and the lab bills, so we were rolling in dough. But <laughs> the first two black and white movies, I had the, no money. I was just out of film school and USC, you know, in those days was expensive even then. Um, the only way I was able to make um, those first two movies for $5,000 was the lab guy, Mar Alapano, who I noticed, I think, did the, cre did the title design for this, he was super sweet to me and used to develop my black and white film because they had a film lab there for their student films for cost. So it was like five cents a foot or something. And that's the only way. I could never have paid like regular film lab prices. So that's how I was able to make those movies. But, but yeah, it was... The USC... the Breaking into the editing rooms, it was some sort of like, I think, sound mixing thing, like the mag film things or whatever. And I think I, somebody I knew went here. I don't, it's very, I just remember literally two o'clock in the morning, like breaking into these 
rooms. Thank you, UCLA. <laughs> and, the, and then a uh, second part of my question. Um, I feel like no one's really been touching, I mean, something you just touched on was the Jesus, Mary, and Chain. Uh, like, there's obviously Jesus and God themes throughout the film, um, along with the skeletal references. And it made me... As long as... What was the other part? Uh, the, the skeletons. There's skeletons oh, skeleton. everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, God is dead, God is gay. It's like a lot of, I feel like, what I was getting from it. I've never seen it before. And um, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that at all anymore, because it seemed like a huge theme throughout the film that I, you know... Interesting, because I'm not religious. I would never, yeah, you know, religious. was in any sort of structured religion. So but you know, one thing really about the film that is right. funny to me watching it today is that you know, as I said, there was no hair, no makeup, no wardrobe department, which is where those T-shirts and the Avenue hat came from because Andrea was an intern at Avenue and stole them, you know, so we'd have something to wear. The, the props and the art design, the production design, most of that was from Marcus's house or my house. And I was saying that um, in one of the shots of Craig in his apartment, there's um, a picture of the films of Andy Warhol, a a one sheet, and that was actually a UCLA archive screening that I went to in the 80s, and very big influence on The Living End. Like, you could really see it in, particularly that film Blowjob, the um, the short film that we're all did. And I, I noticed that my Hustler screening, which is another movie that was a big influence on me, and you could really see it in the framing of this movie. It's clearly something that I was not very taken with so but what i was saying is like all the a lot of the stuff is just whatever we had to stick in the room and the apartments were literally like andrea's apartment marcus's apartment like the car was the car i was driving at the time there was my clothes I'm, were basically all my own clothes from my Oh, uh, yeah. You no, know, literally i would go to the uh, actor but mike's saying that he thinks the leather jacket was mine but it's possible. I don't know about that. The, the Jesus and Mary Chain shirt was definitely mine. But, um, but yeah. So it was, uh, if the God reference might be a little accidental. I don't know. Uh, two more questions. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you so much for doing this. I saw this movie, um, I think, uh, two years ago now, and it quickly became one of my favorites. So thank you so much for coming here and doing this with us. Well, thank you for coming into a li to a live theater. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my question is um, that moment at the end when he has the gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger, he orgasms and. Wait, I, no I can't hear what. You the moment at the end when Luke has the gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger and he orgasms and there's no bullet in it. It was a very, I remember it was a very striking moment for me, and it was uh, something that I had a lot of questions about. So I was curious, like, what the what the thought process was in uh, coming to that moment. Like, how did you come upon that moment uh, to conclude the film? I don't really know. I mean, when I write my scripts, it's very mysterious. You know, it's just like kind of some of the muse. And the characters really start talking and do things, and you're sort of transcribing what they do. I don't know if that's what your process is like, but... Um, it was just, I don't know, I just had this thing that he, this would be happening and that he would pull the trigger. Like, he's ready to go there, you know what I mean? And that it's like the gun is empty, so it's almost, like, worse <laughs> than, than um, it's almost worse than if he had killed himself because it's, like, kind of the now what. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's, if you're as bad as me, Gus, but so many of my movies are based on, because I'm a film school brat and I went, to film school for so long so many of my movies are based on moments in movies like that end um the end of the movie which is one of my you know one of my favorite parts of the movie when craig and mike are just sitting on the beach and it's just sort of like this big moment of now fucking what you know what i mean and it just sort of sits there it's very much like the graduate you know what i mean it was i remember when i was writing it just feeling like that graduate moment of just Total uncertainty, like what's going to happen now? And it's like, just no idea. If you remember also, um, throughout, we really bounced all around the script as we were filming, but that scene was always going to be the final scene. Uh, did we film at the end? Yeah. We I just pretty much waited for that 
and the shower scene. <laughs> <laughs> we saved those for the end. Yeah, but the last. There, it was like this, everything was kind of headed towards that scene, and we were all nervous, I think. I, I just, we were talking about that scene over dinner, and, you know, we didn't have a permit. We were just on this Bockweiler beach out, and, and it was like the dirtiest, grungiest beach, and there were airplanes flying over every fucking five seconds. But it was so amazing. I mean, that to me is still the way it's shot and the way it's composed. And it's just like one of my favorite scenes I've ever shot. And, you know, you guys are both so good in it. And it was really just like, it was like literally, I think, three people. Like it was us and maybe you and a sound person. I mean, it was like nobody. And we were just out in the middle of this dirty beach filming this scene. And there was nobody around. You know, I mean, It's just like nobody stopped us. It was crazy. We were pretty lucky, really, because we didn't have any permits anywhere. Yeah, nothing. We got kicked out of a couple places, but basically, guerrilla filmmaking, we would arrive, we would run through it maybe once. Well, it's once. a testament to you guys as actors that you could, you know, I mean, like, do it in such literally hostile, like, <laughs> circumstances. It was, some of it was really And it was hostile. cold, it was cold, too, I remember. It was like, oh my ass God. cold. There was a couple... One one scene that actually got cut was the scene where we were lay, laying on this this freeway that was being constructed, and I had my shirt off. And of course, you had Mike, your shirt off. And Mike was <laughs> did Mike pouring, have his shirt on? <laughs> Mike was pouring uh, Hershey's syrup all over my chest, and and it was freezing out. And I mean, L.A. freezing. I, like, I was literally sure. shivering. And that's the, the Cooper only, scene. You probably that's Mike, where Cooper appears. Oh, is that the as Cooper a blind scene? man? John Cooper from Sundance appears as a blind man walking, and that was edited out. <laughs> but it was in the Sundance cut, I think, wasn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah. Greg, how much of the film do you say, or would you say that you actually were shooting that you shot? That I filmed? Yeah, you filmed, as a cameraman. You filmed the whole thing. No, no, no I mean, that's true. <laughs> I don't know. Was there a second cameraman that I didn't? Well, I guess Rick Linklater shot that one Chris, shot in no, Texas. No. Chris didn't. Chris Munch actually shoot just some, a couple of the scenes. Chris, I, I think, know he did the I lighting. Chris right. did the yeah, lighting, but I think I shot everything. Chris was also. I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not a um, technical person. So Chris was always like really helpful about the foot candles and the distance and the focal distance and the, the this and that. But um, but I operated the whole movie. And he was just doing hours and times, which was so yeah. beautiful. Yeah, at the same, at the, also part of the Queer New Wave. Was he on the panel? No. <laughs> I thought you were, so <laughs> selective memory. Okay, one more question. films well thank you yeah um i was actually just curious i noticed a big difference uh versus like doom generation some of your other more visual films versus this one which is a little more realistic um what are your stylistic differences and why do you pick them for certain films and uh, i'm having a hard time hearing can you yeah. ask again um i was asking about your visuals uh your stylization of your films I noticed that there's a big range between like this one and other ones like Doom Generation and Nowhere. And I was wondering, um, what's the major difference between your like, I guess, realism versus hyper-realism? Yeah, um, one is Doom Generation was my very first film that had a, like a budget. It was 35 millimeter and it's the first film I had a cinematographer and a production designer and you know we had a whole real crew and walkie talkies like Gus and I were talking about how it's kind of a big jump because he went from Mala Noche to Drugstore Cowboy and all of a sudden you know you're used to kind of three people and doing it all yourself and then you have all these people around and everything takes longer um, but you know like Gus Gus was talking about how he has a lot of he does like a lot of storyboards you know Gus's background is going to RISD as a visual artist so and my background's similar in the sense that um, I've always been really interested in drawing painting I was really into like I used to draw my own comic books when I was a kid so I always like create these storyboards and I have a visual idea in my head of what the of what the movie looks like so I did find that 
once I sort of graduated to having a crew, it was much, I loved being able to create the imagery without having to do the grunt work, <laughs> like trying to figure out what the focal length is and trying to sit the, le you know, you literally just sit there at the monitor and go, no, it needs to be this, it needs to be a little bit this, you know, and it's having that, um, having that taken away and you don't have to worry about the technical aspect of it. I, I really appreciate that part. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, awesome everybody. You thanks, Gus. For coming out. And thank you to Gus. The Gus Van Sant. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>